now. Adi Shavit will be with us in a moment. So let me say a couple of words about him. He's an entrepreneur, speaker, independent consultant, experienced software architect, and a computer vision, image processing, and machine learning expert with an emphasis on real-time applications. He specializes in building cross-platform, high-performance software combined with a high production quality and maintainable code basis. Adi is the founder of the core C++ users groups in Israel. And he said a couple of fun facts about himself. This is his third time at Code Dive, so I think he's pretty experienced for today. He enjoys meeting the global C++ community and finds it hard to refrain from submitting talks to C++ conferences around the world. Actually, this is not his last one. He's going to end up uh, this year in Core Heart Belarus next week. Please give a warm applause to Adi Shavit. Thank you very much. Adi Shavit, C++20 coroutines generators. And let me read it because here we got the proper version, coroutines and other brain unrolling sweetness. Good luck, the court right. is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is, uh, we have uh, four talks about coroutines and this one is actually very complimentary to the one we had in the previous session. Uh, who here was uh, present at the previous presentation? Okay, nice. So uh, a lot, many of you. So uh, it's very complimentary, although it's standalone. So even if you missed that one, I recommend checking it out online later. But our, my talk is uh, standalone. And actually, I'm actually going to give you a taste about coroutines and uh, specific, more specifically about generators. I'm only going to focus on the user, user side and not going to talk about all the compiler magic that happens behind the scenes, which is something that other, uh, some of the other talks are going to show you. So in this sense, again, it's, I'm trying to uh, be complimentary to them. And I really hope to stimulate you to learn more and to experiment with these, uh, this new feature. Right, so we all know functions and uh, also known as subroutines. And let's take a very simple example. Let's say we want to iterate over a sequence and uh, print the elements. So we can write this function, vectorate, and this function actually ha uh, does two things. It iterates over the sequence, and it performs some operation. In this case, it prints it out. Now, what if we wanted to do some other operation? In this case, we'd have to write a new function uh, to, and perform that operation on the whole sequence. Another example that we might uh, want to do is let's draw a line. So if we go online and look at some uh, computer graphics code, we may s uh, end up seeing something like this pseudocode. I don't need to go over it. It's a partial Bresenheim implementation. And again, we see that this function actually does two distinct things. It iterates over the pixel positions along the line and then sets a, pi the, a color to a certain pixel. Now, if you look at the line it, uh, at, at this code, it uses a function called put pixel and it makes several assumptions about this function. It assumes that it's available in the scope, of course, because we, want, we expect this code to compile and link. It expects it has a, a, particular, uh, um, a, a particular signature. And it, ex it expects that it will do the right thing when it's called, uh, namely putting a, a, some color to some pixel on the screen. And another implicit thing it assumes is that it will actually return control flow to draw line for continuing our, our operation because we are in fact in the middle of a computation calling an external function. So a very typical thing that we see about subroutines is they're eager and they're closed. So they're eager in the sense that they eagerly process the whole sequence before the function terminates, and they're closed in the sense that they have some predefined operation that they apply to all the elements of the sequence. Now, one common option for avoiding some of these aspects is passing our, our callback functions. And most of us are familiar with callback functions. In C++, we have many, many, many different ways of using callback functions, different mechanisms. We, have, uh, we can pass uh, function pointers. We can pass lambdas. We have uh, callable template parameters and concepts. All of these allow us to pass uh, some callable object and have it uh, uh, operate as, as a callback. And in fact, many of the STL algorithms work exactly that way as if whenever we're passing predicates to sort, for example. Now, callbacks have their own set of issues that we need to contend with. Uh, one of them is called inversion of control. Basically, we're passing 
uh, our control flow to an external function, which is not necessarily trustworthy, it's not, valid, not necessarily valid or correct. And as I said before, we're basically giving up our control in, mid in the middle of computation and having to expect that this function will, will indeed return. The second thing is called callback hell, is basically where our program flow jumps between decoupled parts of the code. So if we're trying to debug our code or maintain our code or review the code, it has a very heavy mental load on what we have to keep in mind when we're jumping between different points of the code to actually understand what the code is doing. It's not serial anymore. It's not easy to see a single algorithm like you see, let's say, uh, some pseudocode and follow the logic of the code. So although, and even then, although the code is not closed anymore, we somehow exported the operation to the callback, it's still eager. So we're still running this callback on each of the elements of the sequence. So the question is whether we can break the, this, uh, 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 these two operations open in some way so that kind of, I, I think about like flipping it inside out. And, uh, separate the iteration from the actual operation. And of course, the, the answer is uh, something we're all familiar with. It's the design pattern of iterators. So iterators, we have many of them in the standard library. They're introduced in, uh, by Alexander Stepanov in 1993. They came into C++ as part of the standard library in the C++ 98. And we have a whole bunch of them inside the standard library. And very often, Iterator types are actually standalone types. And in that sense, they're very often not directly um, coupled to a sequence. They may only be uh, loosely um, coupled to a sequence. And let's look at some examples from the library. So we have the standard iStream iterator, which allows us to read elements from the stream using the uh, input stream iterator. We have a reverse iterator, std reverse iterator, which is an iterator adapter, and that reverses the direction of some given iterator from a sequence. Another iterator that we have from C17 is the recursive director iterator, which is an iterator object that recursively iterates over all the elements of a directory and its subfolders. Now, note that for recursive director iterator, there isn't actually a sequence in memory of the program. The sequence here is the, the file system itself, and it's not an, a concrete object inside our program. But from the iterator point of view, we're kind of oblivious to this fact. So we're thinking about we're getting each and every one of the file names or the directory structure elements as if they're part of some sequence, the ephemeral sequence that, that's living inside our program. And of course, we can also write our own. We're not limited only to the standard library. And I'm, I, I want to, as an example, I'm showing uh, OpenCVs, OpenCV is the com Open Computer Vision Library. It has, a, it's a very large and popular library, and it has one uh, class called CVLine Iterator. And this is used to iterate over all the pixels on a rasterized line connecting two points. So if we want to draw a point, we can, and we want to perform some operations on the pixels on a line between two points, we can use CV line iterator. And it has a very typical uh, API for an iterator object. Um, as we can, uh, it, there is no explicit sequence. Again, as I mentioned before, the, the positions of the pixels along the line are actually calculated during the uh, lazily as the iterator progresses. Now, and we, we can get basically we're using the, the the reference operator to get the actual pixel, and we can use the increment operator to get to, to calculate the next position. Now. I'm not going to comment about all the public members here, but we're going to pick on, uh, on CV line iterator a little bit more. And the way you use it, I just copied and pasted some code from the OpenCV documentation. And you can see that we can draw a line by setting color to the value. So we're creating the iterator, giving it some image, two points, and uh, the, an another parameter related to the connectivity of the line. And we want to copy the pixel values into some vector. So I'm creating a vector, and vec3b is the three element uh, uh, color value. And we, we're running a loop. The loop is uh, in using i to index the, the, actual, the current pixel. It will run until it.count. Count is a member of this iterator. 
class, and we can access the, the actual pixel values. So this is a very uh, common uh, uh, pattern, and it shows us the power of iterators because we don't, when we wrote CV line iterator, we don't need to decide what operation we want to apply to the pixel. So in this case, we're copying it to some vector. In the same way, we might want to set the color, maybe do some gradient colors on the line, or maybe we want to uh, generate some other values. Maybe we want to sum the pixels or calculate the average color along a line in, inside an image. There, the, the possibilities are endless, but CV line iterator doesn't care because it only gives us access to the actual position. However, there is some still uh, 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 iterators themselves are an imperfect abstraction. So uh, even if I'm ignoring the public members and the fact that there is some casting going around there in the actual interface for CV line iterators, it, it's actually there are some more severe concerns that apply to all of the iterator objects that we may encounter. And I call them the awkward coupling and distributed logic. And I'll, let's uh, see what that means. So awkward coupling really comes from the question that all iterator objects must ask ourselves or, or must ask themselves, or more specifically, all users of iterator objects must ask themselves. And this is, how do we stop incrementing? How do we know we reach the end? How do we know maybe there is no end, but there must be some way to, to tell? So for CV line iterator, we already saw there is some public member called it.count, and we must iterate exactly count time, or at most count times, and anything beyond that is no longer a valid use of the object. For the standard iStream iterator, we, we need to compare this iterator object to the default constructed iStream iterator, which is kind of a universal type of object, and whenever the equality compares to true, it means we've reached the end. Um, another st standard library type we saw is reverse iterator, and for that we need to compare it to the R-end iterator of the underlying sequence, and yet more recursive it directory iterator needs to compare equal to the global STD end function called over the iterator. So we're seeing even in the standard library there are several conventions for determining when the iterator uh, is no longer can no longer uh, proceed. So Let's say we have an algorithm like sort or, or any of the uh, other um, STL algorithms, and we need to pass a begin and end iterator to these uh, algorithms. And le let's say we have two sequences that we, we need to sort. We can actually pass the begin iterator of one sequence and the end iterator of another sequence. And since these two sequences are of the same type, this will compile and, run and, and not generate any warnings. But in fact, because we're passing iterators of the same type but not of the same underlying sequence, we're having to, we will have undefined behavior. So in the best case, it will crash. In the worst case, it will not crash, but just do something uh, we, we cannot uh, know. So. When we're using iterators, we're passing the responsibility of keeping these begin and end pairs onto the user. The user must be in charge of passing the correct pair of begin and end iterator, and that's a problem. That's an API design problem. Now, the answer to the, this awkward coupling is something that we also are getting in uh, C++20, although the concept is uh, earlier than that, and that's ranges. Ranges are actually an abstraction on top of iterators, and we can create a single object that is a range from, uh, for example, a begin and end iterator. We can pass an iterator in some size or an iterator in some stopping condition, and then we have a single object that encapsulates the concept of a range, and the awkward coupling problem goes away. And C++ has, uh, C++ 20 is getting ranges. It's a an incredible addition to the standard library. I recommend you check it out. I'm, I'm actually uh, only mentioning it here, but uh, unfortunately there is not enough time to talk about all the virtues of ranges, and I really encourage you to go and check it out. Now, although ranges are generalization of iterators, or because they're generalization of iterators, they still suffer from another difficulty when we're coming to implement them. So using them is actually very convenient and very nice. The API is very friendly and composable. But when we're trying to implement iterators, we have to 
contend with the same problem <coughs> that, we s that we can see in implementing other iterator types. I call that problem the distributed logic problem. And in a sense, it's a cousin of the callback hell because the iterator API implementation requires this, uh, what I call distributed logic and centralized state. So wh while the iteration loop, oh, thanks. While the iteration loop itself is externalized as we wanted, now all the intermediate computation step and computation variables are stored as mutable members, as we saw on, the, we can see on the bottom of the header of the or iterator class, and the iteration logic is now split between the constructor, with the constructor which sets up a lot of the logic, and the dereferencing operator and the, the increment it, uh, operator. And when we want to read, when we look at the implementation of the CV line iterator or any other iterator class, we now, it's exactly like we saw with the callback hell, where we're trying to jump between different uh, methods to understand the logic flow, and there is no longer a nice linear sequence of operations <coughs> that show us uh, the, the progress of the logic and the business logic. So if we're trying to implement some uh, more convoluted algorithm, more complicated logic, following the logic makes it very difficult. And the fact that we're keeping in all the local variables are now transformed into, member, me uh, into members, they become, uh, we're losing a lot of the aspects that are related to the locality and scoping rules of the language. So, because they're essentially like global variables for the object members. So, we can see that our logic is distributed between the, the, the constructor and the operator, and the state is saved in, in our operator, uh, sorry, as, as data members. Now, we can, if I, it, now, we can now compare the two different types of, of approaches to doing uh, such a, uh, an iterator, uh, iterating algorithm. So on the right, we have the distributed logic that we saw for CV line iterator, which is, although it's uh, lazy and open just as we wanted, it still suffers from the problem of, of distributed logic. What I did, I just copy and pasted the implementation parts of CV line iterator in, into this function called uh, process line. And then we have a nice serial implementation of the, of the line drawing algorithm, but again, we're back to a regular function, which is eager and closed. So it seems as if we have this trade-off between eager and closed uh, or, and uh, lazy and open. And, uh, and we have to decide whether we want to give the easy iteration to the user, but make our lives difficult for debugging these iterating classes. So if only there was a way to write some simple serial iteration algorithm and still somehow abstracting away the iteration. And really one of the um, best ways to do that is using coroutines. So again, uh, uh, coroutines are actually a very big subject. And as you'll see in uh, other talks here, there are many, many aspects. I'm only uh, actually going to talk about a very particular aspect if, uh, of coroutines. But in general, a coroutine is a function that can suspend its ex execution uh, at uh, wherever the, uh, the programmer desires. It can return some intermediate value and be resumed later at the same point. If you've seen, you we were here for the previous talk, we saw some examples and I'll show some more examples. And in contrast to threads, which are preemptive, coroutine co co uh, co switches are cooperative. So the programmer controls where the switch happens and there is no involvement of the kernel. So the kernel scheduler is not involved. And if you think about it, returning this intermediate result from is exactly what we wanted because for a lazy computation. So we have some loop and we want to inter return the intermediate result as uh, in part of our mid computation. So <coughs> If this is the process line function that we saw before, if this function were somehow a coroutine, then this bottom line, the do something, could be changed to just yield this value as an intermediate result. And the code is still linear, the code is still readable, uh, very easy to, to follow, but we're getting the benefits of something that's iterating, iteratable. So, 
A few years ago, I needed to, I implemented this algorithm, which was really nice, and it used coroutines from Boost, and some other uh, group in the company, they decided they wanted to use that for their own product, but their product was actually compiled with mscript, and today we have uh, WebAssembly, and they wanted to run it in the browser. And I said, well, this is used as Boost coroutines, and Boost coroutines actually use something called uh, hardware uh, coroutines, which requires compiling Boost with mscript, and that was the whole big deal, and it, it wasn't possible. However, it turned out that even in Boost, there is a very old, implement, a very small implementation of something that uh, basically a header-only switch-based macro coroutine library, which allowed, us, allowed it to be C-compatible and some very cool C tricks to get uh, uh, coroutine operations, especially for generator types like this one. Um, but I'm actually not going to show you all of that because C++20 is getting coroutines. So we're going to focus on how to do it properly with no uh, C, C macros and no hacks. And it's really dance, as I said, it's dance with the distributed logic. Now, a function or a, sub, uh, a function is a coroutine if any of the following happens in C++20. If it uses the co-await uh, operator to suspend execution until it's resumed, if it uses the keyword co-yield to suspend execution and return some value, or if it uses the co-return value to complete execution and return a value. <coughs> Now, how do we know if a function is a coroutine when we look at the signature? We cannot. So this is a really important aspect of coroutines. Coroutines are an implementation detail of a function. So coroutines are functions, and the fact that we're using the coroutine machinery and the, co the compiler generated magic with the coroutines is actually an implementation detail. And looking just at the signature of function, we don't know if that function is actually implemented as coroutine, as, as a coroutine, or if it's a, a regular function that maybe just happens to return a coroutine support library type. And as I said before, there's lots to say about uh, C20 coroutines. And, uh, we will act, in fact, in this talk, I'm only going to focus on the co yield keyword. And uh, you can see some of uh, the other examples uh, in the other talks because I'm only going to talk about synchronous generator types. This is a very uh, motivational talk, and I think this is a really great way to, to see how, how coroutines make code easy to write <coughs> and easy to understand. Just a minute. So, <coughs> now what we've all been waiting for, let's see some code. So, we have this little function, Zorro. I'll give you a few milliseconds to read it. Uh, now, what does Zorro, Zorro return? It returns 42. The return type is int, of course. And is it a coroutine? No, it's not a coroutine because we just saw what a coroutine is. Remember, we cannot tell that it's not a coroutine from its signature, only from the body of the function. So. Uh, now we have uh, uh, another function, it's called coro, and what does coro return? It doesn't return an int. Uh, it doesn't return 42. And what is the return type in this case? It's actually not int, and is it a coroutine? Yes, it is, because it uses the co-yield keyword. Right, so how do we use this coro? Like we use any other iterator object. So. Uh, Core returns something which is a generator, and it's a range, so we can put it in a range for loop, which in this case will just run once. We can see we have the uh, auto v of coro, and then we print the v. Then at the next iteration of the loop, the, there are no more values in the coroutine, so the loop is going to terminate, and it's just going to print out v. And we can do it slightly lo the, the exact same thing in two other ways, which are slightly more verbose, but again, we're always trying to give the user a nice user experience, so in this case, uh, this is. Uh, but in some cases, you may need to access things this way. This way, but again, the, I, I always prefer the range for approach. But we can see that Coro is actually returning something called gen uh, a g an object, uh, 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 a generator, and this generator has a begin iterator, and we can use the dereference operator to access the the first element. In this case, we only have one, and of course, uh, w once we increment it, it will be equal to the to end. Now, 
Obviously, single element ranges are actually quite boring in this case. And since coroutines are very lazy, because they only calculate the next element, they don't try to calculate everything beforehand, we can very easily generate infinite ranges. So in this case, we have uh, IOTA, and all it does, it increments this initial value by one, always returning it. So and once it reaches the unsigned in maximum, it will wrap around. So it's not uh, infinite uh, values, but again, it will always lead a new value. And this one, in fact, never, uh, never terminates. But that's not a problem, because as we said, this is a lazy algorithm. So we can use std uh, copy n and give it 42 at the begin iterator and uh, uh, some value 9. <coughs> and we'll print out the first nine values that the iterator generates. So this is where we see the fact that uh, lazy using lazy iterators is very convenient. So, but actually, I I, am, I kind of lied to you, right? Because the, although all the code I showed until now actually compiles and, and works, and it, it's really a, a Microsoft Visual, Stu Visual Studio feature that whenever it sees the auto return type that I used before, it somehow automatically infers it to be something called std generator of t. And this, this is the actual object that returned from the coroutine. Um, Maybe auto return types will be returned in the future. Um, um, it's actually pretty uh, probable. However, the reason it cannot be implemented or supported in C20 is much more severe is because there is no such class as STD generator. And the C standard is not going to ship with any standard coroutine support library, it only ships with, the, uh, with an a specification of the low-level machinery that allows the compiler to generate these uh, coroutine support objects. So we either have to write our own, as we saw in the previous talk, and maybe we'll see in, in the next talks, or we have to use some of the libraries provided by either, for example, Microsoft, and there is an excellent library called CPP Coro from Louis Baker, who implements uh, many, many different types of coroutine support types, and that's maybe the, the main problem of using uh, coroutines at this time with C20 is basically we have to roll our own or hope that somebody uh, provided a, a suitable coroutine support type for us. So let's see some more interesting examples. Um, <coughs> so I once needed to process the neighborhood around a pixel in an image and sup when we reached the, the closest neighbor which was, had some definition. And my solution was to scan the image in some ever-growing spiral until I bump into this neighbor. And the coroutine approach, or the, the generator approach, was very suitable for that type of application. And <coughs> I basically decided to, do, to essentially spiral around the source until I find the neighbor. And you can see the, 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 the coroutine spiral up there. And Essentially, it starts at some uh, the zero zero elements, and then infinitely loops around that pixel, generating the new positions. And I'm, I'm actually not going to explain how it works. You can work through it later. But the nice thing is that you can see that the code is very compact. It's very serial. Although I'm co-yielding values, and if I had to split that between some constructor and and some other method, it would be much more difficult to follow. So I think this kind of proves the point that although there is some logic and the, the, it's not super obvious at first glance what it does, it's actually generating an infinite sequence of, of pixels and it's easy to follow through and, and uh, read through and understand it. Now, <coughs> now let, let's say I wanted to draw the spiral with some uh, pretty colors, so again, I want to create an RGB color generator that will be basically uh, cycled through infinitely. And in this case, to get all these nice bright colors, I want to use the HSV color space, which is not really supported by uh, most displays. We have to move to RGB. So I'm using OpenCV and creating a one by one pixel image and crea uh, crea uh, giving it the colors, cycling through them. And at every iteration, I'm uh, returning the current color. So again, I'm creating an infinite, spi uh, infinite generator which will uh, provide uh, the current color for the current pixel. And 
this will give us this kind of animation. Now, all that's left to do, really, is to draw the, draw the pixels on the image. And the question is, can we use a single for loop to do this? How do we iterate both of these generators in tandem in a single loop? Because if a uh, range for loop can only iterate on a single range. Well, the answer, of course, is we can zip them together. And we can see an example of zip. And you can see that coroutines can be templates. So we have a very, very simple um, implementation of, of zip, which takes two generators. It gets their begin iterators and starts walking them in tandem until either one of them is done, if ever, of course, because uh, in this case, both of them are actually, actually infinite. And then it yields uh, a stood pair of, their, of the yielded values of each of the underlying generators. So we can see uh, we do a make pair of the DRF of IT1 and IT2. So this is actually very cool. And, and uh, of course, the, the, the ranges v3 library has a much more powerful zip view that uh, should work similarly. <coughs> and it's much more generic than this very simple uh, implementation. But I don't think that's not prob that's not going to be part of the ranges library for uh, C++20. But again, it shows us how simple it is to write our own, to roll our own very simple functions uh, and use them. So now all we need to do basically is uh, we can see how we use how I c we can create this animation. Basically, we use a range for loop. Inside it, I'm using the um, uh, I'm get I'm calling zip on Si spiral and hue cycle gen using st uh, structured uh, bindings to catch each of the elements of the pair. So pause would be the current pixel position, color will be the current color, and then using OpenCV to make sure that I'm inside the image and setting the color to the image. So it's very simple, and really the only difference between these two animations is that beyond the the, the, begin the starting point is that. For the hue cycle gem, in this case, I'm giving it a, a step one, or, and I think in this case, it was a step of 10. So you can see the colors are switching more uh, rapidly. Now, say we have a binary tree, and we'd like to, op uh, to iterate over its nodes. We've all, uh, all learned about the three ways, uh, popular ways of, ri of uh, iterating over nodes of a binary tree. We have in order, pre order, and post order. So in this case, we can write three methods. <coughs> so we have uh, in order, pre order, and I didn't put the implementation of, of po post order. And we can see that they're actually very, very simple. And we can see that methods too can be coroutine. So essentially, we're looking at the left child of the tree and iterating over all of the, basically we're recursing and co-yielding all of the values from this child. So we're recalling the range for loop calls the in-order methods of the left node, and this is essentially a recursion co-yielding its value. And we can see that the only difference between in-order and pre-order is the fact that pre-order co-yields its own value before co-yielding the values of its children, and the in order first gives all the left children's uh, elements and then its own and then the right. Now, <coughs> if you can note that we have three coroutines here, three methods, each returning the same type, how, uh, which is in this case, it's uh, value gen, which is uh, std generator of int. However, each one of these methods, although it returns the same type, it has a different implementation. So when we were, uh, when we were writing lambdas, w each lambda has a different unique type. But in this case, we're returning exactly the same type, although the, the actual implementation of the function is different. So the keen observer will, will smell that there is some kind of type erasure going on underneath the covers. And this is... <coughs> a hint of where we can see them. And I wrote this function order, which actually returns the correct generator for a particular, um, for, for from a particular enum. So we can have uh, uh, 
a, a, a for loop, range for loop, and just g say, I want to go over our nodes in a particular order, give this enum, the return, ta the return value will be the generator, and it will be the correct generator chosen by the switch statement. So there is some type erasure going on in the background. Uh, we're, not, we're going to ignore it at this time. <coughs> but you know, all these methods really are doing is yielding the co-yielding uh, co the values of the uh, recursively of, of all the generators underneath, which is kind of tedious. So <coughs> the CPP core library has a really cool type called recursive generator, which in addition to being able to gen to co-yield elements, it can actually co-yield itself or co-yield uh, an object of the same type, which basically does the same loop that we saw before. So in this case, if we use that, then in order would look like this implementation. If the left node is available, then just co-yield the recursive call. The in order of the left child will call this, will return a recursive generator. It will co-yield everything internally, and then we can co-yield our current value on the same thing. And I think this is probably the most concise implementation of an in order tree traversal that I've ever seen. And uh, understanding how it works, I think it's really, really cool. It doesn't really doesn't get much simpler than that. Right, so <coughs> one of the ways I like to think about how coroutines are generated, and again, this is from the user point of view. So when one day we want to create, a, a, to use a coroutine, is it's kind of similar to how, conceptually it's similar to how we use Lambda. So Basically, we have this definition of something that looks like a function, and the result of creating a lambda or the result of calling uh, a, f uh, a coroutine is actually an object that's generated by our compiler, which has some associated operator and method. So in the case of generators that we saw now, it, will be, it has a, a dereference operator and a plus plus operator. Now, some of the differences, and that's why it's not really an analog to lambdas, but in many ways, when we're trying to figure out, uh, to, to wrap our heads around what coroutines are doing and how they work, then we can think about, uh, about them conceptually similar to lambdas. However, as I said before, lambdas, the return value from a lambda call is some unknown type created by the compiler, and it's unique to that particular Lambda implementation, whereas for coroutines, the return type is the return type from our coroutine library, and uh, there is some kind of type erasure going on underneath that allows it to be, uh, allows the, it allows the compiler to hide the actual implementation of the function itself internally. And lambdas uh, implement the concept of, of a callable object, essentially it has a function call operator, Whereas coroutines may implement different types of, of concepts. For example, generators are always assumed to be input iterators. Uh, so we can use them in range for loops and call std begin and std end on them. And of course, the data from lambdas is stored in the closure object. And essentially, it's implemented as members of this lambda object. Coroutines are slightly more complicated. It's called the coroutine frame. And unless it's optimized by the compiler, they're actually stored on the heap. And, and some of the other talks here will actually explain how, how this works. So there are differences. But c in many ways, it's, it's, it's nice to think about coroutines. It helps to think ab about them similar to lambdas, especially when we're trying to think about lifetimes and where the objects are actually stored, when the structures are called, and so on. So there are still some pitfalls with coroutine. So uh, one of the major problem with uh, coroutines as they are currently defined is called dangling references. So this code seem, uh, seems reasonable. Um, we have a main function. We have a, a coroutine called explode. OK, this is a, a small hint. Um, and it's taking a, a std string by reference, iterating over the characters one by one, and co-yielding them. And our main function iterates over the result of explode, which is a generator, and just prints out those characters. Seems rather innocuous, but in fact, this code is, uh, is, is going to crash. And there's a very long blog post by Arthur O'Dwyer, which this is only the simplest version of, of this uh, problem of dangling references. And the reason is that 
when the std string reference is copied into the coroutine frame, it's copied as a std reference. And since we're passing hello world as a temporary literal, the, te the, the string literal here creates a, std st a temporary std string, which is passed to the generator object. But the generator, unlike a lambda, uh, uh, the generator object doesn't actually do anything with that value. It doesn't st begin running until the body of the for loop starts running. So <coughs> although it returns a generator, a temporary generator object, which will be uh, a lifetime extended into the for loop, the reference to the temporary string is not maintained. And this is, in fact, something you can read. It says something general about range for loops that uh, if we go to CPP reference and look at the how range for loops are implemented, we can see, but beware that the lifetime of any temporary within range expression is not extended. So if we look at the top line, auto refresh range takes the value of range expression. That's fine. That's the generator object itself will be extended. However, any internal copies that it makes will not, the objects that are copied will not. And in this case, we're passing uh, uh, a const reference to an object, so that will not be extended. And again, by the time we call begin uh, in the for loop inside uh, inside the court, in the s is no longer no longer exists. It points to some uh, it's a dangling reference, and it doesn't point so to an actual object. So. As a general tip, always take coroutine arguments by value. So the way to fix this is to take constant string by, uh, as a copy of the, of, of the temporary object that created here. Um, if you're using uh, coroutine lambdas, then again, capturing by va even uh, the closure types capturing by value are not sufficient. So things you want to carry on until after the initial suspend point, you must pass as arguments and make copies of them. So, coroutines are a really new feature of C++, and we do have them in other languages, although C++ does provide a very, very uh, powerful uh, low-level mechanism for creating many types of coroutines. Um, but as I said, they're not complete and they're not perfect in many senses of the word. So. Although, and we've seen coroutines as templates, we've seen them as methods, we th we've seen them as lambdas. Um, however, as defined in the C++ 20 standard, they cannot use plain return types, uh, like I showed the, uh, the auto, which was more for explanation, and, uh, but th that's not actually valid uh, standard conforming C++. And you cannot use concepts for the same reason, because there is no way to assume something about these types, because there are no concepts at this time. Uh, also, we can't, they cannot have uh, be ex, uh, const expert functions. Uh, they cannot be constructors, destructors, and well, they can be the main function. Uh, I'm assuming, I'm hoping that uh, there is no reason to remove some of these limitations. But as of C++20, they cannot. So these are not supported. And um, you know, uh, lambdas became part of C++11, uh, and they were incrementally made more and more powerful from C++11 to C++14 and 17 and even 20. And I expect that we'll see the same process happening with coroutines, and the same thing happened with const expert. So um, I, I think this is a, a really cool feature, and it's only going to get more powerful. But the main, I think, current limitation is the fact that there is a lack of standard library support. So the standard library shipping with C++20 will not contain any um, coroutine library support. And this is a real shame. Uh, until then, we either write our own or we use some of the uh, s uh, existing libraries like CPP Coro, as, the, as we saw before. Um, one of the main reasons is because it's difficult to get the API right. It's not clear what everyone wants, and that means that there is a quality of implementation issue between different libraries. For example, the, S the std generator that comes from Microsoft doesn't support uh, reference types. So we have to maybe wrap it in some std ref, whereas CPP Coro does support reference types. So again, there's a quality of implementation issue regarding to the library. <coughs> And maybe even more important, this is related to a question someone asked before, is quality implementation of the compiler. Coroutines can uh, uh, involve a lot of code generation, 
and the level, the quality of the, the optimizations that compilers can do to remove some of the heap allocations related to the coroutine frames, maybe move it from the heap to the stack in certain cases, especially cases like the synchronous coroutines, or for example, things related to removing the type erasure. These are all optimizations that most compilers uh, that vary in quality between different compilers. I believe that a lot of this will improve over time as the standard is ratified. Um, so, as I said, this is a very motivational talk about generators. Some of you may be fam familiar with uh, Python generators, so in this, uh, many of the things I've shown here are similar to that. Uh, it focuses on generators uh, from the point of view of the, the user, but there's uh, a, a lot more to learn about coroutines, and I hope you, you stay for the, the rest of the talks here. Um, there is I, I put here a few really interesting resources that you, f you can find more uh, to learn more about coroutines. There's a massive list of coroutine resources from Matt uh, at this link. Uh, CPP reference has a very nice page about coroutines, although I believe it will be improved. And if you're not on the C++ Slack, you should join. The, s the coroutine channel essentially has everyone involved in standardization and all the considerations, a great place to ask questions, uh, uh, and, and you should definitely check it out. Um, a ver a some version of this talk, actually much more detailed uh, version of this talk, is going to be available on my blog. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you for coming, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Big applause. <laughs> Adi Shavit, together with us. High five is fully deserved, yeah. so Thank let's you. go for that. Thank you very much. Uh, as always, this is the really good moment that we still have a couple of minutes to ask questions. I hope there are some brave people right here in the audience. And if you wish to ask a question, please feel free to come downstairs and I'll, I'll be more than willing to pass the microphone on to you. Let's have a look around. I'm just in the limelight, so... Okay, here we go. What's your name? Hello, I'm Samir. Okay, so I'm passing on the mic to you. Come on. Okay, hi. So I just wanted to ask, is there any way through maybe some other hacks to differ to split the definition and declaration of a coroutine so we can ship it via binary and maybe a header? I'm not sure I understood the question. Yeah, so when defining a cor coroutine, we have the always have the out return type, if I got it right. Is there any way to s maybe be possible s to split the definition and the declaration of the function, so of the coroutine function? Well, the return type is part of the function signature. So, and as I said, the auto when I wrote auto, it's just for expository purposes. There, you must write some generator of t or task t or whatever type you want you're expecting because the coroutine generates an object which has certain API properties, like an input iterator. So, yeah. um, but you can have a header file that contains only the signature and the, implementa the, the implementation of the function may or may not be an actual coroutine. I, I, I actually have an example here. If you look at the tree traversal, so the, f the method order is not a coroutine. It's just a function that returns uh, a coroutine type library, uh, like in this case it's an uh, experimental, uh, sorry, it's uh, yeah, a std experimental generator, but order itself is not a coroutine. It only returns the return value of coroutine. So as I said, coroutines are an implementation detail of a function. They're not part of the signature. Okay, thanks. So another question, when we are all on the tree tra traversal example, just did I get this right? We do not face the fear of stack overflow when doing the traversal this way. Not any more than you would in a regular uh, recursive call. Yeah, so I see co-yielding it. Well, a co-yield, the, the, the you should separate between the co-yield and the recursion. The recursion happens in where we call the in order to create the generator. And then when we're co-yielding, we're returning a value from that generator. 
but it's not any different than other recursion. So when you're doing recursion, you always have the fear of stack overflow. It isn't dif any different than what we have here. So if your regular recursion doesn't have stack overflow, you shouldn't have one here. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the first question. Any other colleagues who would like to ask a question today to Adi? Just having a look around. There is someone coming here. Yeah, okay, project. so let me. What's your name? Yeah, it's like. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding performance. Do you have any benchmarks of uh, existing implementations of coroutines? Okay, the about benchmarks, the reason I didn't put any benchmarks is exactly as I said, there's a huge quality of implementation uh, issues here. It depends on your platform. Many, for example, Microsoft implementation was built initially as a proof of concept to show that this is possible, that the APIs work. And they didn't necessarily put all the effort into getting uh, optimized builds. C++20 uh, isn't out yet, so really the compilers are fine if they haven't optimized this. I think that's a great question maybe for uh, next year or a couple of years and when when the compilers can uh, say that they officially, first of all, that the standard is officially ratified and compilers say that they're fully conforming. So uh, that's when we should do the ben benchmarking. Until then, they have a grace period where I'm not going to do any benchmarking. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. So we had a question anticipating the future. Uh, any other colleagues from, yeah, let me go straight to your place. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Piotr. Uh, could you shed some light uh, for the call typical call aid use cases? Showing co -wait. Well, co-yield is uh, really co-weighting uh, uh, on some value, but again, um, what I wanted to show is how to write your own functions uh, and specifically synchronous generators. Co-weight is more related to um, non-preemptive uh, asynchronous code and that's kind of beyond the scope of what I'm, I'm talking here. Okay. Yeah. Big thanks. Anyone from the upper parts maybe he would like to have a walk right here? It's just like, you know, being in the movie. <laughs> so maybe still f feel free. We have uh, at least four minutes still to go. I'm trying to have a look right there. So people wake up if you are there. <laughs> okay, so if not, then maybe very slowly, we would be drawing to the end of Adi's third presentation inside Code Dive. Please give a warm applause once again. Thank you. Adi Shavit. <laughs>